A Carmelite is a soul who has gazed on the Crucified One, who has seen him offering himself as a victim to his Father for souls, and recollecting herself in this great vision of the charity of Christ, has understood the passionate love of his soul and has wanted to give herself as he did. On the mountain of Carmel, in silence, in solitude, in a prayer that never ends, for it continues through everything, the Carmelite already lives with God alone, as in heaven. So she hungers for silence, that she may always listen, always penetrate further his infinite being. She is identified with him whom she loves. She finds him everywhere. Through everything she sees his radiance. Is this not heaven on earth? My sisters tell me I had told them early on I was going to be a nun. But I guess I blanked that out when I hit my teens and going to college even. Um, didn't come back to me until my mid-20s, late 20s. I started going to daily mass with a friend. I had a sensation of God, um, or maybe just an awareness of how great he is. And like, he's greater than anything ever. And I was just filled with a tr tremendous desire to serve him. So I said that to him, I want to serve you, what can I do? And I'm 28 at this time. I was teaching um, at a Catholic school there. Before that, I was a paralegal. That wasn't going anywhere. You know, as far as helping the humanity part, <laughs> that's why I got into teaching. And I was there for a year. But then I just had this greater desire. And um, so I, my question to him was, how can I serve you? And that same mass, I go up to communion, I come back to our seat in the pew, and my leg knocked to the floor a brochure about Carmelite life, although it wasn't, a, it wasn't the nuns, it was the secular order. So I checked them out, and they said, yes, come on board, you know. I said, well, I think you need to teach me the office, and, and a lot of delays there. I never learned it, um, never actually have an met with them to learn it. I think it was all God's, you know, providence. He, I think he just wanted to put the idea in me of Carmel. I first, I started with a prayer, basically very simple. It's like, God, I know you're calling me to one place and just uh, show me what it is, you know? And I started at the very beginning and um, nothing, nothing was hitting my heart. The, the Franciscans, Dominicans, you know, I was teaching. Why wouldn't teaching hit my heart? It did not. And I love the prayer, the, the poor, you know, because um, we, you know, this downtown Anchorage, a lot of poor people around. And, um, and there, so they had a place in my heart. But as I was going through this book, nothing Franciscan hit me. And then towards the end, you know, Sioux City is that, that towards the end, um, there was a picture of a nun in, in, uh, the back valley behind our monastery. And she's in this huge valley, empty uh, um, the wall um, behind the valley, on the other side of the valley. And she's just looking out, big sky, big open sky, and uh, the, just she and God. And that's what hit me. It just hit me so strongly. Um, and the words, I mean, I put them in myself, but it spoke to me of silence and solitude. like. This is where God wants me to be. This is where God's going to find me. I, I wasn't thinking of me finding God. It was how he's going to, I don't know. That's just my thought processes at the time, or what was going through as my heart was doing these <laughs> flutters. Doctor, when you receive the first communion, and God grant you your petition, and so, well, I'm not really worth it, but it would be nice if I become a nun. <laughs> and then, and I forget, after, you know, I have to do the school years. When I was uh, like a young age, and we think about the in the future, my future, so there is a lot of fear, oh, how can I live my future? <laughs> and then, so finally, I started my religious life. So there is a ups and downs, like everybody, even the religious life. 
So anyhow, I came and just live. Um, but our community is um, Mother Teresa and the sisters and people, you know, they passed away. But their sisters was so joyful. Everybody loved that atmosphere. Uh, contemplative life, not only just praying mental prayer, but whole day is a con you know contemplative life. <laughs> so I'm I was walking, doing something, and then they sort of came. I I feel like I'm, I'm very free. Um, something interior freedom I felt, and the whole schedule, or focus on living with God and Jesus, and then not myself. And everything is, every schedule, each different schedule, just joy, just <laughs> came out. And I was so happy, always smiling. And then um, somehow I have to come to United States. And then so I wasn't sure which comment I am, I know I gonna enter the United States, but I wasn't sure where I had to go or something. And then later I came here, then I, um, I made my first vow on her to say again. So, oh, thank you, <laughs> Holy Mother St. Teresa. I had to pay off my debt, and uh, so I got two jobs, lived with my dad, um, paid $50 a month rent, you know, room and board, and then every check, paycheck, like, <laughs> pay my bills, and I made it. Uh, I made it. I, I just, and that was a miracle in itself, but I just, I was dying out there in the world before I came, because um, I was so afraid something would happen, something would keep me from getting here. So then, by the time I actually did get here, uh, it was November 21st, Mother Teresa, she picked the date, and I'm like, okay, if that's what she says, we'll make it. So I get here, and my point was that um, crossing the threshold, because every passion or every aspirant, you know, she comes here, and uh, when it's time to let her in, Mother brings her in through the sacristy, and they have a crucifix there, and you know, so when you cross that threshold, you kneel and you kiss the crucifix, and I just start up, <laughs> waterfall. <laughs> and, um, and then Mother takes us back, you know, to the chapter room, and all the nuns, they stand up as you enter in, and they give you a round of hugs, and it's just great, and of course I'm crying, and <laughs> sister, <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> Those first months were like heaven, because Jesus wants it to be heaven for you, because he's, you know, he's like, this is great, <laughs> and it is, and you, f you just, you're on cloud nine, or I was, okay. Take all that to prayer, all these interactions, um, misunderstandings, you take it to prayer. What did I do wrong? You know, you try not to complain about somebody else, but look at yourself, you know, like, what did I do to provoke this or that? And um, so it's a real self-examination, and that's how you really grow, because uh, the more you get to know yourself, the more you get to know what Jesus sees in you, and that's that's the basis for a relationship, you know, this true, deep, honest assessment, uh, knowledge of, of one another. I tried going to a Carmelite monastery, but I did not persevere. And um, I'm convinced that it was because of the enclosure. Um, and I probably from my missionary work, all that time of um, working in the boonies and hollers of Kentucky and Ohio, um, I, was in, I was in the God's gracious, glorious creation most of the time. Um, so I didn't persevere to, to Carmel my first try. But when I left, I wanted to go back. There was something that was still drawing me. Um, since I was afraid of the cloister, I tried to be a hermit. So for about 16 months, I was a hermit and persevered that. And so, um, but then gradually I realized that I needed some incarnational obedience. <laughs> I was obeying my own rules and oh my, was I becoming holy. So um, I left and decided to try Carmel again. And I sat down on the cot 
and it said, your heart is in Sioux City. Um, I wasn't hearing voices, but it was very clear to me my heart was in Sioux City. And so I called up and said, do you have a place for me? <laughs> and I've been here ever since. I think that in one sense, deep down in every person, I think there is that desire for simplicity, um, a desire for oneness, a desire for unclutteredness. And um, I think that's what we could offer someone in the world today. Um, the freedom, I think all those things that we let go of bring us a real freedom, a simplicity in our own lives to be able to set aside time for God. And so I think it's rare to find a place where, where a person really experiences that. Um, it's always been my desire here, any, any time I've been in a position of leadership, I always have greatly desired um, that the sisters love one another. And this is one of the things that Holy Mother St. Teresa has always spoken about, the, the, the three things that she holds dear to her heart, her detachment, love of the sisters, and humility. So, um, yeah, about the charism and the silence and the solitude, that's really it, because you need those two factors. Um, and I think you, 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 do the, you can do this in the world, of course, because we have our secular and then that's what they do in the world. You know, they seek that silence and solitude. Not everybody can make it in the cloister. Um, we have some good candidates that come, very promising, but then um, it's like, I can't take, you know, being this, I need to get out. <laughs> it's like, okay, maybe you don't have a vocation to the cloistered life. Um, I, I guess in my view, my view is that when you really, when God is calling you to that deeper into intimacy with Jesus. He's giving you a place in which to foster that relationship. Um, he's feeding you, clothing you. <laughs> he doesn't make your bed, but <laughs> but he does, um, you know, provide, you know, your sisters, we do all the cleaning. And so there's that interdependence to support the life, but all for the sake of, so that each sister has that freedom to, to grow in, you know, love with Jesus. And if you can't take the cloistered life, then maybe, maybe you have a calling to the active life. Um, we do have Carmelites that take care of the, um, the sick and infirm out in the world. Um, so maybe that's what, you know, somebody might need, something like that. Try not to think a whole lot. Give it over to God. If He's calling you, trust Him to find you the place. There's a many different area we can live in out there, out there, but um, this religious life is really um, um, one of the happiest life. There's a beautiful, there's a beautiful text that Elizabeth of the Trinity has on being a bride of Christ that I wish I could memorize, but it's just lovely. Um, and it says everything that I think a Carmelite should be able to say and believe in her heart. To be a bride means to have eyes only for him, our thoughts haunted by him, our heart wholly taken over, wholly possessed, as if it had passed out of itself and into him, our soul filled with his soul, filled with his prayer, our whole being activated and given. To be a bride, a bride of Carmel, means to have the flaming heart of Elijah, the transpierced heart of Tre Teresa, his true bride, because she was zealous for his honor. Finally, to be taken as bride, a mystical bride, means to have ravished his heart to the extent that, forgetting all distance, the word pours himself out in the soul as in the bosom of the Father. With the same ecstasy of infinite love, it is the Father, the Word, and the Spirit possessing the soul, deifying it, consuming it in the one by love.